Don't leave. Hello, Marianne is easy. It's 2014 and, well, you're here to write about, read about, talk about one subject. Sour milk and stolen honey. This is your latest book, your first book, if I'm correct. And I want to know, what made you write it? Thanks for having me, Sue. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I, it's a great question. Why did I write this book? Especially as a first one. I wrote it because it has to be told. The story of my personal journey battling with the bureaucracy of brutal domestic laws. The book is basically about my husband who was held hostage for almost eight years now by family laws in Israel that have prevented him from having his freedom to come home to where he belongs. So I had to write it because I learned that he wasn't the only one and at some point in this awful journey I realised that it needed to be told because Israel's a very important country to everyone, whether they know it or not. In part, then, is this a political book? I'm finding out from the feedback that I'm getting that this might be a hot potato. <laughs> and um, as a Brit, if something's not right, we have process to complain. We have somewhere to go to say, this law's not quite right, this system's not quite right. And in Israel, people actually commit suicide on a regular basis because of family laws which prevent them from living their lives. And there's no due process to complain. But I didn't know that eight years ago. So I became more and more indignant as a British European as to why this democracy wasn't allowing the freedom that I thought a democracy could have. So I just pressed on. Quite a fight. Um, at one point I, I read about your battle in the UN itself, at Geneva, where you apparently turned up with no real understanding of what you were about to do, but faith, hope and your own version of Hercule Poirot at your side. I was asked to go to the UN the day before I went. Um, if, if people who, uh, don't know Israel, um, one of the anomalies is that Israelis complain bitterly about absolutely everything. When it comes to taking an action culturally, they're all really busy. And there was a hearing for Israel's rights and how they treat people in the country, be it Gaza or Palestinians or Israelis. And there was a case to bear about certain aspects of Israeli life and no one could go suddenly. So I was asked to go because as a woman they thought she'll be heard better than a complaining man. So I upped and went with absolutely no idea of what I was getting into. And I learned afterwards that I lobbied, which I never knew lobbying was just asking people to listen. I um, presented and I did a whole bunch of things I never knew were political and it caused an absolute uproar in the UN and they did recommend law changes and missions into the country that had never happened before because no one had ever heard, even in the UN, about Israel's own brutal ways of treating their own civilians. So now it's out there in the public domain, you're waving a flag for justice the in woman. a country that you don't live in. True. Um, has it had <laughs> any backlash over here in, in the UK? Funnily enough, a lot of the backlash has come from the Israel side. Um, uh, many, many Israelis have applauded this book and have, have been delighted that I've written it and that finally a voice will be out there in the West to speak on their behalf. And I, and I use the word speak on their behalf. I want action, I want change. But the backlash has been because it was so honest and it was so true and it was told in real time. And so they'd rather it was softened down a little. People in the West are horrified by this news, but yet again, the propaganda and the way the news works is that it's much easier to talk about the Palestinians than it is to talk about the Israelis. You called your book, Sour Milk, Stolen Honey. 
Is that a reference, a biblical reference, or is that an allusion to something else? Well, for those who don't know, the biblical term is the land of milk and honey. Um, so the element of sour milk and stone and honey is, I think, how Israel's path seems to be right now. It's certainly not the land of milk and honey I knew 27 years ago in my first encounter. But my honey was stolen. You know, my honey, the love of my life, was stolen from me. And that soured my life, it soured his, and it soured my family's life. And so the land of milk and honey did sour everything on a personal level as well. In your book, the heartache and the many battles that you did take on do come across. It's written in a very honest style. Mm. It isn't, one would say, um, an illuminated writing because there are some lacks of reference and, and occasionally a little bit more information would be very welcome. And there are times during that read it becomes very, very obvious it is a first book. Are you going to write a second? Before I answer about the second, I just want to say something about the first. And that is that this was a collection of journals and diaries and commentaries and things that I wrote whilst those events were happening. And yes, there is feedback, where's the social context? Uh, where's the history of a thousand years ago and why haven't you discussed the political, geopolitical systems, etc. I think you'll find, maybe I hope people will find, that when you're in a terrorised situation and your whole life is at the hands, in the hands of one person who may or may not give it to you, it's not the time when you sit and do a history lesson in real time. So whilst it's not Charles Dickens or Shakespeare, it's the truth as it was happening to me. And it was real and it was hardcore, if you like, emotion. So on that, yes, first book could be a little tatty around the edges for those literary folk, but it's real and I can't apologise and won't apologise for that part. That is what it was. As far as the second book's going, yes, I am writing a second book. That second book will have the context, will have more social commentary, and will probably have a lot more stories. And I may throw in a few other countries that can compare with Israel, although you'll find in my book that they hold some real-world records for abuse that you just wouldn't believe. And is there a title for this book? The working title, so is a line in the sand, because at some point I'm going to have to draw one. Uh, I don't know if I can spend the rest of my life fighting for someone who doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and the, the appeal... What, the, I want you to ask people to read this book for a number of reasons. One is it's a love story and we all like a good love story. And there is no doubt there was love there. The second is because there is an insight into the everyday culture of a country that we are all helping financing and are invested in emotionally or financially or on some level with that country because of where it's situated. The third reason I think people might like to read it is because narcissism, which is quite rampant at the moment, is at the root of a lot of the problems in the book, so you'll have an absolute full-blown history of a narcissist. And also um, because mental disintegration and depression and suicidal behaviour creeps up on you and when you're watching that you don't know it's happening until it's happened and so this book describes mental disintegration so you have a load of layers here that you can look into and that's part of real life and I was fortunate enough to be able to write it as it was happening. During the time I was reading your book I must admit I went on a roller coaster of, oh my God, no way, this isn't true, oh it must be, hang on, oh, no, and when I put the book down, I wanted more, I will admit I did want more information, and I came to follow your website, I've read some of your blogs, and particularly your recent blog on suicide really did touch home 
particularly at this point in time we've lost a very real celebrity in the world tragically and you wrote poignantly and very insightfully on that subject I saw that in the book that point reading the blog itself added to it is this more the style that you are going to use for your next book without a doubt um, I got the best advice that was available to me at the time to bring this book to life during the course of putting this book together I suffered a near critical uh, Ill, well, I had a critical illness which nearly took me during which time I lost my mum and uh, lots of family traumas so getting that book out was really difficult and so I hadn't found my way really in terms of maybe the reader wanting well what does that mean and why did she say that and what was this but again I'd say to anybody who keeps a diary they're all there to be picked apart and on the positive side the feedback from this book which I'm very grateful for is that it was probably the biggest act of bravery I've done yet it was harder to face that book than it was to face the UN Marianne thank you very much for your interview today Thanks. and I like yet Ha, ha, ha.